So <clears throat> you said that um, every you've got six acres. What's the what's the total production in a good year that you guys can pull off? So um, in a good year, which is not every year. Um, so we're even though we are very high density, we're we're almost three thousand vines per acre, and most vineyards are these days are around a thousand. So we're three times the, the number of plants, and we do that um, so that not we, so that we we don't want to have a higher yield per acre, but we also want to have a, a lower yield per vine, and we feel that's that's important for. Um, uh, longevity of the vines, but also uh, important for improving our, our chances of, of um, getting the kind of maturity we want in the tannins um, because the vine's not overly burdened with excess uh, crop load that it has to ripen. Um, but so in, in a good year, we get two tons per acre, uh, which is an extremely low yield, um, and we don't always get that much. Um, and that gives us on the order of the ability to produce up to 600 cases, uh, 500 cases, so 6,000 bottles, somewhere in, 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 that, in that range. And by, cases, um, and by cases, you're talking nine liter cases, regular? Kind I'm of talking cases. nine liter equivalents, yeah, even okay. though we don't, we don't offer them that way, yeah. Gotcha. So, so 6,000 bottles, just to say it in a different way. All right, I like it. Um, so what are you drinking when you're not drinking your own wines? <laughs> uh, I like, uh, well, I don't drink my own wine that much, but because, you know, that, that ends up not being so interesting, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> you want to, you want to do different things. Um, I drink, I, I like champagne a lot. I like, uh, Grand Cru Chablis a lot, uh, for white wines, for red wines, almost anything with Bordeaux varieties from around the world. Um, if it's well-made. Um, I like uh, some of the, the finer wines from Spain and, and Italy um, that aren't Cabernet based even, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a huge uh, follower of, of Pinot Noirs and Burgundies. Uh, I do enjoy them, but I, I just tend to follow the Cabernet pathway more than, more than that. Sure. You mentioned a couple of things different differently that you do specifically at Levy McClellan. Um, what are some other things that you do there that you don't necessarily do at Harland or Bond? Well, in the, in the vineyard, there are a number of things. So um, first of all, the, the tight spacing was, was the first, uh, first uh, departure from what we were doing at, at Harland or Bond because those vineyards were planted earlier and we didn't, we didn't have the ability, or even frankly, the interest at that time uh, the, the, they were planted to do that. The equipment wasn't available to manage these very tight rows and things like that. And today there is. So when, when as we're redeveloping Promontory, for example, which we didn't start doing till the, you know, the, around 2009, 2010, we are doing very tight spacing. Um, and so, you know, clearly that's uh, something of great interest. It just wasn't available prior to that. So there's one thing. Um, the other thing is, as I mentioned, was the row direction. And, and that was, that's something that if you don't have, uh, if you're on a hillside, which is what we are on a hillside vineyard, um, you, you, you can't, uh, if you don't have the row direction that's optimal to have equal solar radiation on both sides of the canopy, both morning and afternoon, um, then you have to do other mitigating viticultural practices to help equalize that and to, and to manage that. And so we chose our site based on this notion that we wanted to be able to plant in this particular compass direction. So we don't, we don't have those issues. Um, we're doing, we're focused, um, since the early 2000s really um, on soil health um, and soil compaction or lack thereof. Um, so we're not, we don't run tractors through the vineyard. Uh, we run ATVs, which are, they weigh 500 pounds instead of 3000 pounds. Um, uh, what else do we do? Uh, oh, the, the soil health. 
So we have a we have a hundred percent cover crop, and a cover crop alternates between winter cover crop, which is a very easy thing to do, and is is really almost mandated in almost all vineyards, hillside vineyards in Napa because of soil erosion concerns. But we're we're selecting the the plant species based on what we feel is best for the site and what are are, are native to to that area, and then there's a change in cover crop between the winter and the summer. And typically summer um, growing conditions in Napa, there, uh, there's, there's no rainfall. So um, typically what had been growing there in the winter would die out and just become uh, either thatch or, or was mowed close or it was cultivated or whatever. We're, we're, we're not interested in cultivating because it changes the the soil structure, um, but we are interested in trying to to maintain um, plant species that that can sustain themselves and continue to grow through the summer growing season. So that that means also looking to the forests for species that are able to make it through or nearly all the way through uh, a growing season and and stay growing. The difference between the ability of um, uh, the soil and and the, the soil microflora to contribute to um, the nutrient base of what the grapevines need is directly related to how how deep uh, uh, that rooting system is for for that uh, summer cover crop whether there's moisture retention what what um, uh, other species of bacteria, uh, protozoa, um, uh, fungi, and, and small animals, worms, and, and other, other things that are growing in the soil, um, they're all helping out, and, but they're only going to be able to survive there if you have um, the right conditions. So that means the right pH, that means the right moisture, that means um, the right temperature. Um, as in not too hot. And when you, when you remove that summer growing uh, habitat, your soils typically get too hot to support any of that. So it's all, you know, it's managing, managing it not like a monoculture, which is how, how it was managed for so many, so many hundreds of years. Awesome. When did you realize that you had made it in the wine world? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> Someday I might. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think you know there was a realization. It was it was while I was at Harlan. I, I guess there was an epiphany. It was a you know Parker was was uh, was the one everybody looked to, and and he recognized what was going on at Harlan, and so that you know that gave me an indication of uh, of what was going on. But it was a shift in mentality as well, because here, you know, with a, my nose down, just trying to figure out how to do the best we can and always how to, how to learn more and apply that and, and make sense of that and, and make improvements because of that. Um, here, you know, when somebody puts you up on, on top of a dirt pile and, and says, here's the, you know, the top of the heap, then you have to think, well, you know, once you get to the top of the heap and everybody just wants to knock you off. So it just makes it harder to always continue to want to learn and improve and, and be able to accomplish that. It, it, it's so it's, it's a humbling experience to, um, to focus on what, what got you where you wanted to be or wanted to head in the first place and to, to take stock and, and apply extra focus to keep that in the forefront of your thought process. Yeah. Um, do you have any superstitions either in the vineyard or in the winery? <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's the biggest mistake you've ever seen an intern make during fermentation? Well, the, the biggest mistakes are uh, usually happen at like one or two in the morning during harvest um, and the worst things that have happened to me, uh, not, not for leaving McClellan because we're in barrels, but, uh, or even at Harlan that I can remember, but in other, other properties, um, 
you know, where everybody's tired and they're running around, they're trying to figure out, you know, what to do next and want to get out of there. And so they make mistakes like opening a tank valve uh, or unclamping the wrong clamp on a tank valve. So the valve comes off and everything flies out of there or driving a forklift too close to a tank door and knocking the, the door open and things like that, that are, they make a big mess and are very costly. That's, that's about the worst I've. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. 